before I start out that um you were prayed for. We pray for mm -hmm. you constantly. Mm -hmm. Um and um as I travel around I see a lot of you in the various core, you know, God is God has just laid on our hearts. This this group. Mm -hmm. This group and what this group means. And so as we were as we were talking and E B and I talk all the time and and we're praying, and, and, and God laid on our heart things about discipleship. And Dan, Dan hit on it as well. You know, and, and even the DC talked about that yesterday. How that looks in, 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 in our lives and, and what, when we do it to other people. Because we know that, as I stated yesterday, we can't share anything we don't have it in us. And so as we look at that, what does that look like? What does it look like in our lives? So, I'm, I'm going to put a time on because sometimes I can go a little long. And so, <laughs> so I'm putting time on for me, for my sake, not for you. <laughs> so, um, and, and so God is laying on our heart about this. And, and we just thank, thank God that you're all here. You're, you're all here. And, and, and as I often say, you're not here by accident. That's right. That's right. You're not here by accident. Don't, don't think, oh, what am I? I'm not going to. You're here because God has placed you here for a specific purpose. All of us, each and every one of us, God has a plan for us. You all know that. He has a plan for us. The thing is, do we do it? Do we do what He wants to do? So, what are we talking about that today? When we're talking about discipleship and imitating the holiness, those are the things that God has on my heart. As well as when we talk about faith, the EB is going to be sharing about that. So I encourage you to just to, to just have your heart and your, your ears open to what God has given us to give to you. Because we know that we can't do this alone. And God gives us each other, each other, to, to help each other, to build up each other, to encourage each other. And so that, that's what we're, what we're going to be, be doing. I want to start with a, with a word of prayer, and then we're going to get into it as we talk about discipleship, an invitation to holiness. Let's pray. Our Father, we, we, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your grace and your mercy and, Father, your loving kindness. And I just thank you, Father God, for allowing us to see a brand new day that was never promised to us, but because of who you are and the love you have for each and every one of us, you spare us once again and gives us the opportunity to get it right. Each and every day that we're given is an opportunity to get it right. So, Father God, I thank you for it. Thank you for everyone that is here. Be with us, Father God. Touch our hearts. Transform our hearts to be like you because we know that's what your word requires of us, to be holy for you are holy. Mm -hmm. So, Father God, we thank you for that. So, Father, as we go through this material, Father God, I pray that you just allow our hearts to be just bubbling over with grace, bubbling over with, with excitement, because we know that is what you would cry of us. You're not a boring God, and you don't want us to be boring as well. So I thank you, Father, for that, and I pray that you just bless this time. Yes. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 If you don't mind, I'm going to be transparent with you today. I want to share with you my Damascus Road experience. Amen. Um, and I want to start by sharing that because it happened to me at the age of 17. You know, to be factually correct, it was a, I like to say, a cowardly road experience for me. In June of 1987, in a small church in Norfolk, Virginia. <laughs> I don't know if anybody here from Virginia, but that's where I was born, Norfolk, Virginia. In a church named Mount Zion, Mount Zion Interdenominational Community Church. The scales fell from my eyes. Amen. Scales fell from my eyes. As I heard about the saving grace of God. You know, I've been raised up in church. My mom's been in church all her life. And but at that young age, you know, you get to that point where you play in church. Well, I was playing church because my mom kept me in church. But it wasn't until I got 17 that I really hit that Damascus Road experience in my life. That, that this walk that we're talking about, this discipleship, became real to me. You know, you go to church and you, you, you can hoop and holler like everybody else. Because yeah. everybody else, you know, you, you can do it wrong. And they said, when they're wrong, do it wrong, you do. Mm -hmm. 
But as you get into that time where you focus on God and you allow God to, to transform you, you begin to realize, hey, my Damascus Road experience. Each one of you may have that Damascus Road experience in, in your life. So, you know, I, I remember um, that moment in that church. I was transfixed and even spellbound by the preacher's message without question. And this was a transformational moment for me. When I thought about the idea of surrender at all, think about it. Surrender? Come on. Surrender at all. I had only understood in the context like that of an old word. How many like Western? Yeah, but I love Western. I don't know if you watch Western in here, but I love Western. I love those old, old shows. And so I was thinking about the context of the old Western where that white flag was raised. You know, you see that white flag raised and wait, when that person in combat want to give up, <clears throat> when they want to give up, they wave that, they put on a stick, something white, and they wave it, hey, and everybody know that that means what? I surrender. Mm -hmm. I surrender. And so on that day, the move by the Holy Spirit, surrender of a different likeness touched my soul. And, and though not, not fully realizing what had happened, at the age of 17, I did more than invite Jesus into my heart. I brought under control my will to God's will. Amen. Amen. Because I realized that was so important. You see, it's no longer I, as the song said, that lived it. Right. But Christ began living in me truly then. Amen. It was no more playing church then. That's right. And so I brought under control that. And so I realized that I had to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I had to walk in his ways. I had to do what he wants me to do. I had to be a disciple of Jesus. And I found myself, myself on a journey, surrendering to the will of God for a lifetime. Before long, with all some feelings of fear, with tracks in my hand, I don't know if any of you even know about tracks. By the like day we had tracks, they don't use them too much like they did then. Some people do, some people don't. I, I, I talked to one, one little boy the other day, I said, you know what a track is? Huh? Huh? <laughs> didn't know what it was. He knew what, a, he knew what a flyer was, but when he talked about tracks, he didn't have a clue what, what a track was. So, I remember going on the streets in, in Norfolk, evangelized around my home in the city of Norfolk and in Virginia. And for those of you, that's a great experience when you can go around and talk to people. Mm -hmm. And that's why, I mean, I, I love the Savage Army and I get upset that we've kind of gone from that, yeah. that open air experience. Mm -hmm. And we need to get back to that. Yeah. We need to get back to open air. We need to get back to visitating, visitation. I mean, visitating, excuse me. The door, we need to get back to those things. And, and Colonel was talking about some of that yesterday. We need to get back to that so that we can fill these seats in, the, in, in our cores. And so I thought about that. I remember opening one of the tracks that I had to hand out, that the pastor gave me to, to hand out at that time, at the age of 17. And it included the story of Judgment Day, the day of global accounting. And, and as I look at, at the scene on the track, the illustrator had captured of that day, there was a lonely male figure that stood before God. Just follow with me there. And behind them was a backdrop. There was a backdrop behind them, and and it's a cinema screen like, like of which it is hard to comprehend. And in front was what appeared to be an, an assembly of everyone who had ever lived waiting their turn to be held accountable for their evil thoughts or deeds or whatever it was that they had to do. So one by one, their sins would be revealed, frame by frame, mm -hmm. on this surprising screen for everyone to see. For everyone to see. And so at that moment, that solitary figure looked surprisingly like me. And as I read the scriptures that address this final day where all would be revealed, my heart started to beat faster and faster. 
as my mind ran wild, recounting my every sinful move. I told you I wanted to be transparent with you. My every sinful move. And at the age of 17, I hardly lived. <laughs> my dad used to say, boy, boy, like your life just began. You still got a long way to go. <laughs> and I remember that. God rest his soul. And so despite my encounter with God's grace, holiness seemed like a milestone mm -hmm. to me. And so as I spent time studying the holiness movement, I found it necessary. I found it necessary that I share a little bit of history about me mm -hmm. with you. And hope that this opens the door of your heart to understand the need of such a movement in each of our lives. We need this movement, people. Amen. And it starts with us because you're all in various places. And when you take it and you do it and you begin to magnify what God has given you to take into your community, that's when the kingdom of God begins to flourish because of people like you and I who he has created. You know, so... As I thought about it, the primary measure of one's progress to obtain a state of holiness was measured by the, the absence of wrongdoing, which is what sin. Mm -hmm. And so as a, as a result, in the arrangement of moral and social behavior, there were deemedly people that were unholy. And so these include women. I don't know if you remember back in the day. Some of you might be too young for that, but then well, some of you might be understand, might understand. <laughs> where, where, where women, it was, a pro, it was a problem when women wearing makeup. Yeah. It was a problem when women wearing makeup. That's right. It was a problem with people going to the movies. Yeah. Or, or they called it the, the picture show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm telling my age now. <laughs> well, my mom and dad told me that's what it was called. <laughs> You know, I remember people severely being reprimanded for going shopping on the Sabbath. And I don't know about you, I remember those days when, when, um, when on, on, on Saturday, my mom and they, they would prepare dinner. They would prepare Sunday dinner on Saturday. Why? Because Sunday it was church and home. It was nowhere else. No way, it was like a ghost town on Sunday because that was the day that you rest, you enjoy family. Some of you shaking your head, you've been there, you understand. Yeah. You know, it was a time where you would enjoy time. So, so mom and they would cook, prepare, prepare Sunday dinner on Saturday, then, then finish it up on Sunday after church. Then they had to do a whole lot more to it. And then it was ready and you sat home and you enjoyed each other on Sunday. <laughs> Those were the days. Amen. Those were the days. So we understand that, you know, remiss the thoughts of this was according to the holiness standards of that day. That was the holiness movement of that day. And this wasn't one of those sins that, that I fear had been framed by eternity. Watching camera and successfully living in compliance to the unwritten regulatory framework was a huge step towards a much sought after designation of being holy. If your conviction is that holiness is solely defined as absence of sin, mm -hmm. then this approach was not without benefits for you. Right. Because the pursuit of holiness by solely implementing a regimen of pursuing, of, of purging ourselves, me, you, purging ourselves of sin is a poor copy of true reality. You see, we can too easily become professional law keepers, I like to say. Oh, yeah. and, and some people feel that just because they follow the law, that, that that puts them in the right place and that they are holy. But of course, holiness is connected to being separate, as we all know, distinct and obedient. You know, there was um, scripture, scripture on Leviticus, the 18th chapter, 1 through 5 verse said, God spoke to Moses, speak to the people of Israel, tell them that I am God, 
your God. Don't live like the people of Egypt where you used to live. And don't live like the people of Canaan where I'm bringing you. Don't do what they do. Obey my law and live by my decree. I am your God. Keep my decree and law. The person who obeys them lives by them. I am God. You see, God gave them instructions about how they should live. He gave them instructions for living for two reasons. First one he gave is that they might be a people distinct from all other people on their earth. On earth. In other words, in other words, God wants to know that Israel belongs to him. Want to know that he want to know that you belong to him. And he knows that by your heart. See, he wanted to know that Israel belonged to him and that he was their God and they were his people. Secondly, God gave them instructions that would keep them to live well, to keep them from being unhealthy and to keep them from diseases. Hmm. God also gave instructions on how to have good and godly character. Amen. Those are very important aspects of our life. And he wanted them to know, just as he wanted you and I to know, that he wanted them to understand how to take care of one another. It's another aspect. We have to take care of each other. Brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, we got to look out for each other. We have to take care of one another. And if they were to be God's people, then they must have, get this, God's heart. Amen. God's heart. I think I got a little too far. And then this was what I found, found out was that many tend to believe that holiness is simply a summon to be sinless to be sinless, but it is more than that. In other words,